Okay, hey, let's uh, keep going here. I'm going to just pick up where we left off. I'm going to load uh, a different test map. I'm just going to load test map, which has a server controlled uh, parametric moving actor, um, just to give us some more data here. I'm also going to set set Pi up to run as with two players, and then I'm going to go to this recently added option to go editor preferences play. I can run the server at a fixed 20 hertz and I'm going to run two clients. And so I'm going to run one at say 30, <clears throat> excuse me, and the other one at 60 hertz. And so this will give us kind of maybe a more, just so, some in, more interesting data to look at. Um, this stuff, this isn't perfect. This is just like controlling how the pie world is ticked. And so it's quite possible that systems could not work could make assumptions about how many times things get ticked per engine frame and uh, that those assumptions could be validated by this. But for, at least in this example, for this this content, like this is working pretty well for me and, and I think it's pretty interesting. So just keep that in mind. So, okay, let's hit play. And I don't need to do much either here. I'm just gonna kind of do the same thing, run, run around with some abilities, see my guy moving back and forth. And uh, that's that's probably enough. So hit escape. Okay, so go back to my network prediction window. And okay, we got a lot more, some interesting data here, huh? Um, I don't know why he's there. Why is he there? Oh, okay, that looks like a bug there. That was the, the previous Pi session. Uh, Still had some data there, but this this thing lets you filter that. So somehow there's probably a bug still there, and how that filtering is working when you just like naturally hit play. Okay, um, okay. So first thing to call out here is we just have these yellow lines um, on these tracks, and why is that? So uh, the way I have the pawns, when I say pawn, I, I'm just implicitly mean the flying saucer drone thing. And uh, if I say pusher or parametric or mover, um, I'm probably talking about the blue this blue guy here. Um, so the pawns have, there's there's these tracks here of just yellow network receive lines and that's because the pawns are set up to be uh, in, in, an, in an interpolated mode which means they don't run, they do not run the simulation tick to extrapolate network positions um, whereas the, the, net, the pusher does, he actually does, he runs the simulation tick in between network updates in order to guess at, at, at where the how the actor e evolves, um, and that's still separate from forward prediction. Where forward prediction is, um, you know, this this case right here, where we're actually, you know, we're essentially ahead of the server um, in proportion to our ping, relative about in proportion to our ping. It's more, in, you know, in proportion to the unacknowledged. Uh, amount of unacknowledged simulation time that we've had, which is roughly about where your ping is, but um, depending on how like frame rates and latency line up, you know, it could be that kind of can fluctuate. It not, isn't always going to be perfect. Um, so those are kind of the three modes though, uh, interpolated, extrapolated, which are, you know, this is interpolated, this is extrapolated, and then forward predict is is what these guys are doing um, or what the autonomous clients do. And the the eventual goal here is to have a nice way of bringing additional actors into the forward predicted like bubble or like a dependency sort of system where you know I can say, hey, I want to I want to forward predict this pusher um, in sync with my with my forward predicted pawn. Um, so that'll be the big, that's kind of like the big thing that we are working towards and want to make really solid, but um, isn't isn't quite working yet. And um, hopefully, though, this tool is going to make that easier to 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 work out. Um, but anyways, going back now, uh, the clients are the pawns, are, the simulated pawns are just interpolated. So we just see network updates. We don't see the simulation ticks. I'd eventually like to have. Um, I, I do want to have a way to eventually visualize what the interpolation or slash like correction smoothing layer is doing. Like what what did you actually send to the to the rest of the game code at the, in your finalized frame call, and what did you know what actually got rendered every frame? So that's not really represented here yet, but that's definitely like a that'll be a high value feature to add at some point. But we can at least see here like where your net you, you know the network updates you received, where were they time stamped and what was the what was that rate that you were receiving at? And you can see here it's not quite as nice and smooth as you'd expect. Um, and that happens with just, you know, we have a little bit of fluctuating latency and we have different frame rates and that's what that's what kind of causes that. Um, so it's 
cool. I just, you know, it's a, it's nice to be able to visualize that on this timeline. I think that's the real value of the system. One of the real values of the system. So, okay, that explains the yellow lines. Um, I think the other thing to maybe call out is just, is the different frame rates again, is, um, you know, just going to what the server, is just looking at what the server does. The server, all, all his tick boxes are different sizes. And uh, because everyone's running at a different frame rate. The server controlled actor, the pusher, is running at 50 millisecond um, time steps. So 20 hertz. And all of them are pretty much solid at 50. Um, he's ticking the pawns at whatever rate the input commands are being sent at. And so we have a fast pawn running at 60, and that's giving you 16 millisecond uh, steps. And the one that's running at 30 is giving you, you know, 33 millisecond steps. And uh, yeah, that's, it's just kind of neat, I think, to, to see that reflected here. You know, every, every one step of this guy, we end up doing two steps of this guy. Um, I, sh I should say that that's, this is sort of like, again, how the system is currently configured. Um, and historically, that's how Unreal has worked. Um, the existing character movement component in Unreal does do move combining, and this system doesn't do that yet. And I think at some point we will support that generically to some degree. Um, move combining is when you would take, say, for example, this 60 hertz stream of input commands and just merge them into, uh, in, into uh, groups of two or, you know, merge them together to, to into, uh, into a 30 hertz uh, input stream and in order to re both to reduce some bandwidth and also to reduce um, how much work the server has to do. The server, it's better if the server can take, you know, smaller, bigger steps, uh, CPU wise at least, um, instead of taking a lot of little a, a little short steps. Um, of course, that comes at the that at, uh, the cost of accuracy in the simulation. Assuming you are letting your your client run uh, his simulation locally at 60 or even you know higher frame rates. Um, so then, on top of all that, it still maybe makes sense to to put a finite cap on uh, what your simulation can run at. And in fact, this the network prediction system does allow you to run even at a fixed tick rate. Even if your rendering isn't at a fixed isn't at fixed tick, um, you can still uh, accumulate time and um, run the simulations at discrete, like fixed intervals. And that can go a long way too um, in, in sort of keeping things synchronized and not having to do like move combines and, and that sort of stuff. So th there's a lot of options for, for dealing with that. And I'm not gonna go into any, really any more detail on that other than like, this is just how the sort of, the way that this stuff is set up right now kind of mo most closely mirrors how current Unreal for character movement component does things minus move combining. Um, I think given, you know, depending on the situation, it, it may make sense to have some more of those like hardcore, like fixed ticket rules in, in place. And I, I think we'll, you know, we'll get to that eventually um, and, and, and make decisions for the future. But uh, yeah, I, th I think that covers that topic enough. Um, okay, yeah, so different frame rates and, uh, and what kind of interesting things they cause. Um, I think the other thing that to maybe point out is like, the, simu the, the simulated um, pusher right here has a lot of red in there, and why is that? Um, that that's again kind of goes back to how this system, how things are just kind of currently configured in the system. And I, I don't, I, I think that's cool that the tool kind of shows us this, but it's also maybe not the best. This isn't how we want this to work forever. Um, but let me kind of let me let me let me find a, a good example here of what I'm talking about. And it seems like they often they are often lining up. Here's a good one. Okay. So let's so let's let's just jump back to this this guy here. So just focusing on this bottom, the bottom client right here for the pusher. He got a network update right here, and he reset his simulation. He then took a step to catch back up to where he was prior to that. You know, just like that. Then he took a predictive step. Uh, and then a couple frames went by, a couple engine frames went by because he's, this is the guy who's running at um, 30 hertz. Uh, so he's not gonna actually do a simulation tick every engine frame. So every time I press forward, it's gonna, it might take a couple to get one. But so here we go. So on this frame from here to here, we got a, we got a network update that happened to be like right in the middle of our predictive frames. Like you kind of can look up here at, at the server's timeline and his 20 hertz steps, you know, we draw a line straight down and it does not line up at all with, um, with with this guy's 30 hertz steps. And so we're right in the middle. And so the way the system works right now is it try it, it favors accuracy. It just says, okay, I, I know I was here at this time based on what the server told me. I'm gonna roll everything back to that time 
and then I'm going to take one step, one big step possibly, to catch up to where I was. And then I'm going to continue on with my normal local delta time as, as if nothing had happened. Um, so he's always rolling back and always re-simulating when he gets network updates, which isn't ideal. The ideal thing would be to save us some work and not do that if we don't have to. But I don't have anything to compare this network update, you know, the network state right here. I don't have anything that was previously saved off at that time. So what can I do? Um, and like I said, right now it doesn't do anything. It just rolls back. But what we could do is we could uh, take the two points that we do know, you know, this point right here and this point, and we could interpolate into the middle and then use that interpolated value as the, the thing to compare against. And that would probably be the cheapest way to just really quickly tell us if we were close enough or not. Um, and then even if you do say you are either you aren't sure or you do think that it wasn't close enough, um, another thing that you could do is rather than stimulating the entire step up forward, which a big step like this, I mean, this is a 50 millisecond step, which is what the server is doing, so it's not that bad, but this could be higher. This could have been like 66 or even 100 milliseconds if you know things kind of timed out differently. Um, and that's not good. We, we probably do want to have a finite cap for like how, how much simulation step can you, just bar none, never, never take a step greater than this amount of time. Um, but what I'm trying to say is what we could do is rather than stepping all the way back to where we were in one step, we could step up into the next known position, like right here. If we just took a little step up here from where the server told us to where we last had simulated, we could then compare that value, that output, to this saved off value. And if those things are close enough, then I can just not worry about the rest of the time, um, which could potentially save us uh, some, some work. So this, in this case, it, it wouldn't because we, we were okay with doing a 50 millisecond step. But if we were saying, okay, you have to take 30 millisecond steps, or even if this whole system was working at, like, say, a, a fixed 20 hertz or something. Say, say this guy was running at a, at a lower frame rate or a higher frame rate, I should say. Um, there could have been multiple steps in here if the thing was configured to do so. So just there's, there's ways that this could still be better. And right now we're always, we're always kind of rolling back and re-simulating, but there's different levels of uh, things we can do to, to avoid that. Um, so I think, you know, like I said, it's, it's not the best aspect of the system right now, but I like that this tool reflects that. And as we add more options for how we want to handle this case, I, the tool will automatically reflect what it's doing. And I think that that's, I think that will go a long way to like understanding what's going on versus, you know, logs and having to just look at code and, and figure out what's happening. Um, okay. So that's, yeah, I think that's a nice overview of like what the simulated proxy is actually doing. We've talked about how different frame rates kind of cause different behaviors and, and looks and shapes in this graph, which I think is interesting. Um, I think that's probably where I'm going to call this video now. Um, thanks for watching. And, uh, you know, if this is useful, let me know. I, I would like to make more of these um, as the system is continues to get worked on. Um, yeah. Okay. See you later.